So um, I've given a, a couple different talks about writing, and, it, and usually um, kind of it boils down to reading and writing because they're they're very very similar. So when I chat today, I'm going to be talking about um, reading and writing, and you can look for when you leave here. You're not, I'm not going to be horribly long. When, when you leave here, you're, you'll be able to look for tricks that writers pull, and you'll notice them, and they'll make you happy because you go, "Ha!" <laughs> and, um, and like my, my wife was reading me a passage from this author the other day, this woman that she likes to read, and and she said, "What is she doing here?" She's, uh, you know, I said, "Oh, that's a really sweet transition. That is slick," <laughs> and you'll notice things like that. So um, when I talk about writing, my, I'm, I'm always thinking of reading because, you know, only a hermit writes for themselves, sit in the cave, and, and I hear people say, oh, I just, I don't, I'm, I'm a poet, I'm a novelist, I'm a playwright, I just, but I just write for myself. Really? What, what's the point of that exactly? I mean, and you're probably not going to become a very good writer if you just write for yourself. You should be writing for other people because that's what hones your skills. You have to explain, of course you know what's going on. You don't have to explain that the doorknob has been moved to the left side of the door or the right side of the door, but you need to explain it with precision to someone who's reading it and have them understand it. So, and be interested in it. Um, so I, and I come from corporate America and spent, my writing background is um, pretty basic. I started, decided I want to be a writer a few years ago and so I started writing screenplays and wrote five or six screenplays. I optioned a couple of them. Um, I wrote some speculative sitcom scripts which sound like they're not a big deal but they're a lot of work to do it right. Just like anything is a lot of work. And a screenplay is a massive undertaking. It takes I don't know, it takes a long time, six months, eight months, a year to write a, to write a screenplay. And then I, and at the same time, I was spending about eight or ten years in the advertising business. And, you know, Google's in the advertising business, sort of, but I was on the creative side, I was a writer. And um, I wrote TV commercials, radio commercials, I wrote catalogs, I wrote videos, I wrote corporate messages, I wrote press releases, um, I wrote print ads, uh, you know, I just wrote, wrote, wrote all the time and it was really good training because I was writing all day long and I learned what writing is. I always thought that writing was uh, putting together one clever sentence after another. That's what I thought writing was. And then I learned and when I had to come up with, uh, when I actually had to write under pressure and produce stuff that made sense, that persuaded people and they could understand it, that writing is not about writing. That's one, of the, uh, that's one of the things about writing that most people, in, including some writers, uh, and many people are responsible for advertising and messaging, especially on the internet, they don't understand what writing is really about. Writing is about ideas. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, when I worked at J. Walter Thompson, which is a big giant advertising agency, I was a writer. And I used to sit in my office, I had a window, and I'd look out the window, and I had a pen and a notebook, and I had an assignment, I needed to write, I needed to write a, a, a TV ad for the new, you know, for White Castle, how incredible White Castle, well, one of our accounts, how incredible White Castle was. And so I would sit there like this, I put my, is it okay, can you Google, yeah, Google. Right. And This is how I would work. Oh. You know, I'd have, a, I'd have a notepad, and I'd look out the window, and I was, that's why I learned that writing is thinking. Writing is about ideas. Writing is not about putting together slick sentences. You know, poetry, writing is about ideas and images and messaging. And this one intern used to come up and down the, she was an intern. <laughs> she used to come in my office every day, she'd come to everybody's office. She had this tray and she would put down the mail for everybody and here's your memo for today. And, and I would just, I was friendly to her, so hey. You know, I was like, you know, and finally one day she had the, she got the guts and she said, now, can I ask you a question? I'm like, sure. She says, well, what do you do here? <laughs> and, um, and I was a very productive, successful writer. You know, I wrote a ton of stuff and I produced a lot of stuff. And I, and I said, I'm a writer. And, and she goes, you never write anything. <laughs> and I said, I don't really actually write very much. And, it, and it's true. You do a, um, When you're thinking of ideas, and even when you're writing a book, like I've now written you know, some novels, when you're writing a book, oftentimes you're scribbling away and everything's great, and then you have to stop. Okay, now, now what? And you stop and you think. You might think for an hour, you might think for a minute, you might think for a day and a half. It doesn't matter, but you're thinking. And so I don't really believe in writer's block. Uh, maybe writers are temporary not writing something, but probably only because what they have isn't very, isn't worth pursuing. Or they're thinking about it. Nah, forget it. Nah, forget it. 
Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Is that okay? You can ask so, a question. Like, do you come up with your I, like a big idea? Like if you're writing a novel, you come up with a big idea, and then you, as you go along, you come up with like the smaller ideas of the, yes. the plot, or is it more planned out than that, or less planned out? No, I, I think, I guess everybody's probably different, but I think, yes, you come up with a, can, can everybody hear that question in Google TV land? <laughs> um, I think that you, um, you do have a big idea, you do have a concept, and that's one of the differences in writing a novel, um, and now's a good time to, to mention it. When you're writing a three-act play or a screenplay or a smaller piece, you know, everyone is familiar with the three-act, most writing people are familiar with the three-act you know, which is, which is simple, it's, it's very fundamentally human. Beginning, middle, end. Act one, act two, act three. And, but you have to have a concept that's worthy of a book. And, I, and like, I'll be writing something in the middle of my book and something happens, oh, what if these guys needed to go, you know, over here to get this stuff? Oh, that's a, and I even write notes to myself, that's a whole other book. <laughs> and I'll put it in my drawer for my whole other book drawer. So, um, so yeah, you come up with a concept, and then you, you'll you'll pursue the concept, and then say, uh, you know, I'll pursue something for a couple of weeks when I'm trying to write a book. And I'll, I'll go, you know, this sucks. This is, this is not worthy of a book. It's not. There's not enough here. There's not not going anywhere. I don't like it. I can't make it work. Whatever. So, concept is king, in many things, and it certainly is, is concept is king in books. You know. Um, I'm going to mention Dan Brown later, not that I'm really into popular authors, but Dan Brown's whole Da Vinci Code book was a concept. What if Jesus was married and had family, and somebody didn't want us to find out about that? That is the whole concept. That's it, in the whole sentence, and he wrote a whole book about it. So yeah, it's about concepts, and then you have to come up with other ideas as you go. How does he do that? What's this? Why is that? Why is that important? So yeah, it's, it's full of ideas. But, it's important to think about um, when you're reading a novel, too. You'll hear writers say, I'm having a difficult time with the second act. And to, to which my response is, then you have a bad story. Because in novels, the beginning is just chapter 1, and the end is chapter 21. And chapters 2 through 20 is act 2. The whole book is act 2. So if you're having trouble with Act Two, you need a, you have a bad story. And I know this from experience. I've tried, I tried. Uh, I was writing this novel for you know, off and on for a couple of years, and I'm finding like I just can't make this work. This it's horrible. So I threw it all out, and I said, what do I need is a different story. Hello. So I started writing a different story about some you know the Las Vegas underworld. Like that's a really original concept, you know. And I wrote that for a couple. I wrote it for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, yeah, this, this sucks. So I threw that out, and I wrote another story about some people in New Jersey, and that was horrible. And I had this, this, I wrote another story about this town in Wisconsin, and, and it, you know, like that's this is no, this is weeks of work, and it's no good. And then I finally had this concept for this this book, sort of Hannibal, which nobody can get a hold of because it's, it's, it's hard to find book. Um, but there'll be more. They're printing more. Okay. Um, but and then I started writing this book, and. Uh, and, and this book took off after about two months of writing. I'm like, wow, this book is really taking off. Why is this book taking off? The other book sucked. This book's good. Why? And I had to step back from it and analyze it a little bit. And it's something you can use in everyday life. Why is this relationship working? Why is this one not? I mean, stop and take stock of what's you know what you're doing. And um, I tried all these, you know, these goofy stories that I just described, trying to make, make it an American novel. Now I'm writing a historical fiction novel, which I never thought that I would, until I leaned back in my chair and said, why is this so com... And then I looked in my library, I'm in my little library, which is not, it's very small, but... Um, and I looked along the shelves, and all on the shelves are history books, ancient history books. And I'm like, I mean, I mean hundreds of ancient history books, not written by Harvard professors in 1960, but written by Arian. And, and, and things by Juvenal and things by Plato, and guess what? I've read them. People, you hear about people reading them? Um, I actually read them. And, and there's lots of military stuff in there too, so I'm like, oh, I'm a history buff. <laughs> no wonder I'm writing a hist historical fiction novel and it works for me. So I think that's something that um, I think a lot of writers will make a mistake and, and say, well, you know, um, religious writing, Christian writing is really big right now. I'll write something with a Christian bent. Or, um, you know, children's books are big, or some other type of book is big. And 
Uh, but it, that's, I think that's, a, you know, that clearly that will end up being a mistake for them because unless they're really into it, it's such a huge job to write something well, a huge job, that unless you're really into it, um, it's going to fall, it's going to fail, it, it's not going to work. So, um, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to talk about some of the, the, the key things that you'll see in all books, not just fiction, but autobiography, autobiography any story-oriented book, plays, screenplays. And there's a lot of uh, elements to, uh, to good stories and to, to, to bad stories. But I'm just going to talk about a couple of them so that you can... Um, can so I ask can... a question in advance of that? Yes. Do you think that if they have like, common elements, do you think that comes naturally? Or do writers try to study and find these elements and apply them? I think a lot of study has been done to find these elements and apply them. But I think the other, um, the other elements are things that come organically from the process. I think any buddy with a, the halfway decent intellect would do, would have a, a trial and error where they'd start to write about something and say, well, that's not good. I can't even read this. I hate this. You know? And so you start to find out about things. So, so I, it's, I'd say, yeah, there are, there are some common elements. And there's somewhere there's a guy who wrote, the 30, there's, only, there's only 36 dramatic situations in the entire history of mankind. Was his name Pulte was the guy's name? I'm not sure. I think it's P-O-L-T-I. And they're, they're called the 36 dramatic situations or something, and um, there's only 36 different storylines in the entire universe. And, and it's a cool little thing. And he's actually right. I started reading it, and I'm like, I, I, I think this guy's right. <laughs> um, but, you know, of course, there's a myriad variations on, on top of that. But, but so that some of the elements become obvious because they, you have to start, um, you have to use them, otherwise the, the story falls. And as soon as you trip over one, you see that it works. And I'll, I'll mention some of them right now. Uh, now's a good time to, to, to mention them. Um, plot is one of them. Characters are one of them. Conflict is one of them. Um, context, dialogue, character, prose, discipline, and vocabulary. There's a whole, you know, and, there's, and guess what? The list is longer than that, but I'm just going to briefly mention some of these because we don't have, you know, people write entire books about this stuff. And I'll give you some good books about writing that uh, make, you, uh, make reading more fun, and writing more fun, and more uh, uh, productive. Um, the other thing about, uh, when it comes to writing, before I get into this, you know, you have to love writing to, be, to get good at it. And you probably know, because you have a degree in, in writing. It's difficult to do well. It takes a lot of time. It's largely thankless. And, Fame and fortune is a real long shot in the writing world. These publishers in New York City, they get, I mean, the FedEx trucks pull up every morning, and those guys wheel in dolly full of brown envelopes with people's manuscripts. And, 90, and I don't know what percentage of them, but most of them will never be published. There's some reasons for that, but most of them will never be published. It's hard to get published. You have to be good and lucky. And I happen to get lucky. I, I happen to get good. But I also happened to get lucky, and I can describe all that happened also. But um, plot and character are the big things that get most of the attention. Plot is just uh, like you said; it's a an, um, it's a it, it's an outline of, a, of it's a skeleton about which to wrap your your story, and it needs to make sense. It needs to be feasible. People need to understand it, and there needs to be a couple things in the plot, typically. Um, Hollywood's really good at this. Hollywood's got stuff down to three-act plays. They've got all these screenplays, and they got them down to three-act plays, man. And um, they haven't done a very good job, quite frankly, but they've they're got them down to three-act plays. Um, but there's a plot. There's, in Hollywood parlance, it's called, there's someone driving the bus. Someone's in charge. Who's the hero? Who are or the heroes? Who are they? And, and so and let me identify them right away, because that helps with the plot. And then there are goals. What are the goals? If, if the people have no goals, if they're just wandering around the park, and then the next day they're wandering around at the, at the zoo, and the next day they're wandering around at school, you're just the reader's just like, okay, I can't read this anymore. You know? So, how do you explain a show like the success of Seinfeld then? How, how do you do what? Explain the success of Seinfeld then. Well, that's a um, that's actually a three act play format, and um, they it's it's. Seinfeld's more fundamental than you think. They would set up a premise in the first act, like what was the famous, uh, famous Master of My Domain episode, 
they set that, do you know what I'm talking about? The mm -hmm. mastermind? Okay, well, they set up this, this uh, we're not going to have sex pact. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, in, yeah, the yeah. First, <laughs> in, in the first five minutes. And then the next 15 minutes of the show, 15 minutes of running time, is a 22 minutes of a half hour mm -hmm. sitcom, was all about them conquering the, all the obstacles to not having sex. And then the last five minutes, Kramer breaks down. <laughs> so um, they, it, it looks like they're wandering around and they do do a fabulous job of, you know, a show about nothing is what they've always said, but it's tr truly not a show about nothing. Th those guys have the fundamentals down. Those guys are terrific writers and they put down a block by block plan for every episode. And they, they ventured into the silly and the, uh, they, they, they certainly did a good job at that. But there was a clear beginning a clear middle and a clear end of every episode. The Stinky Car episode, remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they had a clear beginning, a clear middle, and a clear end. So, um, and, and beyond that, I, I'm not the, the world's greatest writer. I'm not the world's biggest expert on writing. Are there exceptions to what I'm talking about? Yeah. Seinfeld pushed the envelope in that area. I think you're right. I think they did. I think they probably had. They're so funny. And they got such a good following. And really, they, and they had such a good thing going with themselves. That I think they got so good that they could probably break some of these rules. And that's one of the things that Picasso is a good example. Picasso was a classically trained artist. And he knew how to do all the stuff by all the classic rules. And he knew color theory and light theory. And he studied all the stuff and got good at it. And then he broke the rules. And I think that you'll see that with every good revolutionary, whether they're in, in, in arts and philosophy and writing and science, they, they learn all the fundamentals first. And then they go about breaking the rules. But if they didn't know what they're doing, they wouldn't be able to break those rules. There's exceptions. But, uh, but Seinfeld's a good, um, is a good, um, is a good example. Um, and Hollywood is really good at this, but so is a lot of modern fiction. Modern fiction being probably anything written after 1950 has a much faster pace than stuff that was written 100 years ago. Much faster pace and a much more demanding audience. Back in the day, People had nothing to do. You know? <laughs> they didn't have ESPN. They didn't have World of Warcraft. They didn't have the Google or the Internet. You know, they didn't have um, their kids playing soccer. I mean, they, they, they lived and worked and went home and, and managed to read a book for a couple, uh, maybe an hour before they had to put the candles out. And so I think it was much easier to be a novelist back then because you weren't competing against anything. So the bad news is uh, reading in general is going down reading books, reading poetry, reading uh, plays, reading fiction, nonfiction. Um, that's the bad news. The good news, which I think is really good news, and when I talk to my publisher, who will watch this, um, <laughs> I'll make them watch this, I'm going to insist that they really put a big push in China and India, because <laughs> literacy is going up. Reading is going down, literacy is going up, that's a positive sign. A hundred years ago, hardly anybody had, you know, there were illiterate people all over the United States a hundred years ago. In 1906, I don't know what it was, 40% of the people in this country couldn't read. And maybe it was higher, I don't even know what the numbers are, but you know, in another 100 years before that, only 5% of the population could read. They were the lawyers and the politicians and nobody else could, could read. That's why they had town, a town crier. I'm not reading the new rules, here they are, everybody listen. Because these guys couldn't read. But, um, I digress as they say. And, um, most modern writing has what's called a clock. And um, a clock is, in, in my newest book, which I have, oh, I'm not going to sit here and read my book. I mean, lots of guys do readings and stuff, and I just think it's blah, blah, blah in my book. It's, <laughs> it's going to be kind of boring. I'll, I'll read a couple little pieces that will reference to, to demonstrate some technique. But I did leave you guys, and it, it, it was probably, it'll be fun to read. It's, um, it's the first chapter of my next novel, and it's a rough draft. So if you're into reading, if you're into writing, you're going to be able to look at this and go, oh, this is how the process works. Whoa, it's ugly. <laughs> but you'll also see that, oh, this is good. Okay, I get it. I get it. Whoa, I get it. And guess what? You should, by the, even reading this rough draft, you should get to the chapter two. And I, and I included the first page of chapter two, I think. Yeah, chapter two. Um, you should want to read, when you're, when you're done with chapter one, you, you damn well better want to read chapter two. <laughs> That's the whole idea. And, and, and even I wanted to read chapter two when I was to chapter one. Um, but uh, the new book 
has a clock, and the clock is this. Alexander the Great, this actually happened, he laid siege to this island city of Tyre, that's now in, in modern day Lebanon, but um, it was an island city, and it was impregnable because it was surrounded by water, and you know, who could, who could lay siege to it and conquer it? Nobody. But Alexander decides to build a pier to get to it so he can move his giant siege engines up to it and bring down the city, but it's taking him some time, but every day, it's getting closer, closer, closer to the city. And the, uh, the heroes have to get to the city, get some secret stuff, get out without getting killed. And it's impossible. How are they going to do it? I don't even know. I'm not done. It. That's almost, I'm almost done. I sort of know how they're going to do it. But the point is, I, I, throughout the story, throughout the book, I go back to a little, I, I remind the reader, oh, and uh, Alexander's a little, got a little closer this week. <laughs> oh, they got a little bit closer. They're almost there. Now they're moving up the engines. It's only a matter of time. So. This is literally, a, uh, um, and, and this book has a clock too, it's a different kind of clock, it's a weather clock, they need to do this stuff before the snow falls, but, um, but it's only a matter of time, in particular in adventure books, in particular in Hollywood, you know, speed was the classic example, you know, hey man, the clock's going to run out, and, and what's his, who's the crazy actor guy in speed, he's going to blow up the, okay, no. No. no, who's the bad guy, who's the bad guy, oh. who's, uh, oh, the bad guy in speed? Yeah, anyway, he's going to, um, when the clock strikes 12, well, Cinderella, you know. That's it's right. a race against time, man. Oh my God, the clock strikes 12, I turn into a pumpkin. That's a classic clock. So you find examples of, it, of the clock everywhere. And then the other thing you do in, um, in modern fiction, and you, what's his name, Eugenides? Mm -hmm. um, what's his name? Jeffrey Eugenides. Yeah, he's good at this. Yeah, Franzen and these guys are all good at this. They they raise the stakes in the story. They, you know, the story starts out, oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, oh, he's got to do that. What? And as the story goes on, they raise the stakes. It happens a lot in poetry too. You know, things are coming to a head. Hello. You know, and the things are a lot more dangerous at page 300 than they were at 200. And this book is a good example of that. On page, this book is 400 pages long, but on three, on page 359. Story appears to be over. They've wait. They've accomplished everything they set out to accomplish. Why does Terry have forty more pages? <laughs> when the story's over, it should be over, right? No. On page three sixty, the author reveals, uh oh, one more task remains, and it's more dangerous, with higher stakes than all the previous tasks. And even the, even the pe the group, even the people are like, oh, shit, <laughs> God, and, and so. That's called raising the stakes, and it really helps to propel the story along because you know, you're, not, you're like, oh, now what? Oh my God! Oh my God! Now what? The reader is like, oh, for God's sake! Are you kidding me? <laughs> and how are they going to, you know, how are they going to do this? So um, that really contributes to pace and pace. I learned about pace when I was a little kid. I watched the show called Lost in Space, which was probably a horrible show, but it's on Nickelodeon and stuff, and I. And I would, I would watch the show, and they'd have the whole show, and at the end of the show, they would end the show. And they would break to a commercial. Then they would come back. They had like two minutes left before 8.30 hit or whatever. And they would show the first two minutes of the next episode. You know, a meteor would strike, and the family robbers would run out of, the, out of their uh, spaceship and, and run around the corner to see what happened, and then and one of the characters would go, Oh my God! <laughs> Freeze frame to be continued. And I'm, I, I'm a little kid, man. I bought a hook, line, and sinker. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? Mom, I have to be right here at 7.30 next week to find out what's going on in Lost in Space. So that's called a, um, I don't know what that's called. I call it a teaser, but it can be, it can be anything. But I, I use them at the end of every one of, almost every one of my chapters. Here's an example, let's see. Um, this uh, a hero, one of the heroes in this book has been captured by these guys and he's like, what are they doing, where are they taking me, what, they're not talking to me, they're keeping me in the dark, what's going on, and he, but he notices some unusual things about this particular group of soldiers. And he says, at the very last paragraph of this uh, chapter, he says, these men weren't soldiers, they were hunters, but this was obviously no hunting expedition. Where then are they going, thought Strabo, that's the hero, and why? And that leaves a big fat question mark. Yeah, what? I, what? Yeah, what? And the reader's like, yeah, what? Maybe I should find out. You know? And so the, the reader starts to, you know, the reader wants to find out more. Um, in the next chapter, 
this is another leading character. We're not sure why he's dragging this guy along on this expedition of his. Um, but, but he says at the end, um, thinking of warriors of gold and death, Nargon, that's this other guy, glared after him before settling into his saddle pad and smiling to himself. Wise choice, he thought. So I will have my revenge and more. And so you're like, that's the first hint. This is on page 70. Oh, it's a revenge. I'm, I'm, what, what, what? And more. What's the more? What's the more about? I better turn the page and find out. I mean, that, that's the that's called keeping up the interest. I don't know what, what else you want to call it. And then you can throw unpredictability into it. This is another way to uh, create tension and interest. Here's our same guy, now going again. This is the very last sentence of chapter seven. Everything seems to be going cool right now. They've done some stuff, they've made some progress, and he says, or, or the, the author says me, I say, um, all was as Nargon predicted, or so thought. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, some bad shit's gonna happen to these guys. <laughs> um, so, um, that's, that's about pace. And that's, you know, this is an action adventure story, so those, those little teasers are different than, than um, than many, but you know, the, the Jonathan, Jonathan Franzens in the world will have a different type of statement. And it will be, you know, it will be similar, but his mother-in-law had no idea what he had in store for her, you know, and she was about to find out, you know, I mean, he, he would end chapters like that um, to keep your interest. And then there's, uh, in particular, I write historical fiction, but um, there's something called context and it applies to all Books. It applies to autobiographies. In particular, it applies to uh, nonfiction because things have to be believable and factual. And you know, for example, you can't have in a um, you, you can't have some guys in China walking down a rural road and overhearing a discussion from two Chinese farmers nearby in a rice field, and, and they overhear the conversation. And the conversation goes like this: "You kidding? No way! Yes way! Dude, seriously?" <laughs> You know, well, that's way out of context. Whoa, 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 what? You know, the reader's just going to, you know, just get flung across the room because that's out of context. That's not how Chinese farmers talk. They don't talk like surfers. Okay? <laughs> and surfers don't talk like Chinese farmers. If, if you had a book about surfing and these guys suddenly started talking like Chinese farmers, that, that would be the, whoa, whoa, what's that? So there's something called context. And you can't use, it's not just in dialogue, it's not just in situations, it's also in the words themselves. And I think this happens a lot in, um, it happens a lot in poetry, it happens a lot in business writing where people use distracting language. And, and, and we've all been a victim of it, or, or we've all been guilty of it, and I've done it too. I wrote um, in, my brother was reading the first draft of this book, and I had a situation where these Celts were trapped and they suddenly realized it. And, so, so, and suddenly, instead of me saying, they suddenly realized it, I said, it took a moment for the cells to process this information. And then blah, 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 blah. You know, and my brother's like, Terry, process this information? That's like a modern computer, to, it's like a Google word, you know. Um, they didn't, they, they are, there are processes, and there is information, but processing information is a modern term, and it would just kind of, it's going to jump off the page and not be right for, for antiquity. So. Um, so it didn't work. Another word, I, I also uh, used the word enabling or enabled or something at one point. Even I caught that when I'm like, no, he can't do that. That's like a, that's like a AA thing. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna, you know, so, so some words have such, you know, uh, they, they have such meaning for us already. You can't, you actually can't use them. And, um, in particular, historical fiction is a big deal because you want to. Um, I, I, I was writing a scene the other night, and, and this guy suddenly realized something, and I wanted to say it was like someone flipped out a switch, but they didn't have electricity or switches in ancient Greece, so it wasn't going to fly, you know. And they, they could fly it. Um, all right, and then um, there's a lot of dialogue in. Uh, the, the, this is a really big crime in nonfiction when people try to reconstruct dialogue. And the, the, the number one rule of, about in dialogue is not to use adverbs. And you'll hear, it's a, just don't use adverbs. An adverb is, um, you know, if you touch that, I'll chop off your fingers, he said menacingly. <laughs> okay, I think that just the fact that you chop my fingers off, if I touch that, is menacing enough. I don't think I need to say menacingly, you know? Or, she said uh, mischievously, you know. If it's not clear, what she just said, 
if it's not clear that she's being mischievous, then you're not writing it. Well, you need to say something else. You know, maybe, maybe she looked at him with a grin and then says something. But you don't, you, no adverbs. And, and, and don't use exclamation points either. Just don't use them. I, mean, I think it's four exclamation points. I didn't bother to count. I, I hope there's only one to four exclamation points in this whole book. Because they're like gasoline on the page. They just, they just like blow up. And you should, and if you have to use them, you're not writing properly. You didn't make the point. You didn't get, you didn't build a little rhythm, to those three paragraphs to get to that point to make that thing be a big deal. So, no exclamation points. And then you're just, when you're doing dialogue, it's a he said, she said proposition. This is why I wanted the board, this whiteboard. Um, you know, person says something, blah, blah. She said. Not she said menacingly. <laughs> you know, no menacingly. Um, and then, he re you know, response. He says, oh, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't really, I don't want to go there, Sarah. I don't want to go there. <laughs> He said, you know, not, and, and, and occasionally you can use the words like he whispered, he mumbled, he asked, but you can keep those to a minimum. It's, it's a he said, she said business when you're dealing with dialogue. And if you end up with a, um, a rapid fire sequence of dialogue, yes, he did. No, he didn't. I don't know. Why do you think he did? I don't know. It was my dad. My dad. Or <laughs> about your dad? I mean, you know, it's okay. Um, but don't lose me. You need to use some techniques in there because I'll, I'll, I'll forget who's saying what. So there's a couple of different ways. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, yeah. I have a question just specifically about that. So like if I'm reading a book, which I did recently, and I, I have no idea who's talking like in the book, was that just like poorly written or yes. is it more just... Poorly written. You should have a clear idea who's saying everything. <laughs> like I have that problem a lot. I'll go back and try to like figure out which turn it is starting. You should have, yeah. that's, that's lazy writing. You should have a clear idea. And here's all, all the, here's the, here's the only thing these people needed to, needed to do, the writer who wrote this. All they needed to do was... Um, break it up and say, you know, I didn't. Yes, she did. I didn't. No, yes, I did. And then, you know, she pondered this for a second <laughs> before responding. Okay, before responding, you're wrong. You know, she, <laughs> she says. So now I know. Now I, I was almost lost, but now I know that she's speaking again. And then he talks, and then, and then he responds. And then she responds again, and then he responds. I'm starting to get lost, but then she says, she says something in the dialogue that helps me out. She says, you know, let's say the guy has a beard. Okay, lots of guys in my books have beards. So she goes, you just can't get this through your fuzzy face. Well, I know that she doesn't have a fuzzy face. So therefore, it must be, she must be talking to him because he has the fuzzy face. So within the dialogue itself, and, and, you, and you see that, this is where... You know, this is where nonfiction, man, it's a big crime in nonfiction because they, I don't know why, but it is. Um, they forget that we don't know who they're, who's talking anymore. You know, it's not, a, it's not acceptable. A good writer is not going to let that happen to you. A good writer is going to let you know what's going on all the time and not leave you guessing. Because as soon as you're guessing, you've left the page, you've left the story, and you don't want any excuses to leave the story. Um, characters is, is the other, you know, plot's a big deal. I don't need to write anything here. Um, Characters are, are a, a big deal too, and lots of people spend a lot of time thinking about the character, creating some resume about them, this long background. It's all it's, I think it's in the writing schools. You know, she went to Drexel, and she you know she was she, her, her husband left her, and then this happened. But it never gets in the story. But you feel like you need to know all the stuff about this person, uh, and maybe that's a valid way to write. I tried to do that and got confused. There's way too much information. I couldn't remember what happened to any of these people. Um, it was a nightmare for me. So. What I, and, and then the next thing that people do, and it's okay, limited context, is to say, you know, that Derek, he's a greedy little bastard, and I don't trust him. You know, or the, so the writer, so you can have someone say that, that's legit. Or the author can say it, which is a bad idea. The author can say, you know, he was a greedy little bastard, and no one trusted him. And, you know, Okay, that's another way to do it. But uh, the best way to do it is to show Derek in his, you know, maybe he's babysitting his grandpa who's on an iron lung or something, and, he, and he's in there and, he's, and he needs, we know, because we've been reading the story, he needs 50 bucks to buy a new skateboard. He looks at his grandpa, his grandpa's asleep, looks at the grandpa's wallet on the dresser, looks at his grandpa, looks at the wallet, takes the 50 bucks out of the wallet. Okay, now we know a lot about Derek, don't we? We don't need to say anything about 
Derek. And we don't want to. We don't want to say, we particularly don't want to say, since he was a greedy little bastard, he stole the money from his grandfather. <laughs> you don't say it, just say he reached over, took the 50, put in his pocket, and he left. And now we know a ton about Derek. And like, another example would be um, a little, little girl walks up to uh, her, her mom and says, Mom, I lost the lunch money. You know, and, and mother can say one of two things. She can say many things, but she say, on one hand she says, it's okay, Megan, we'll find more lunch money. Now I know about the relationship, I know about the mother. Or she can say, you stupid moron. Now what are you going to eat today? And she pointed a finger in Megan's face. Okay. I, don't to, I don't have to say anything to it. I don't have to go, she was a, a horrible lady, she was a mean mother, she wasn't nurturing, she had some issues. You, know, you, you don't have to bore everybody with all that stuff. You just, um, you just, they just said some things, or they did some things. So the, so the things they say, uh, the, the things that characters say, the decisions they make, and the things that they do describe your characters much better than anything you could ever say about them. And, I, and my, my son, my little boy, caught in, in, in one of my books, I, I was embarrassed because I had written the bad guy. The bad guy appears and I said he had a scar that you know, made him look like he had an eternal frown. And, and my son, just a little kid, goes, geez, Dad, it's a little cartoony, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, it's horrible, you're right. You know? So it's easy to get, you know, I'm, I'm telling you some stuff that I've, you know, I've been guilty of. And any writer who's trying, who's working, is going to be guilty of, of, of these things. And then there's prose. I don't really know what prose is. Um, I hear people refer to prose, and I don't really know what, you know, P-R-O-S-E. Not sure what it is. I think it's, I guess, exposition, narrative, um, Explanation. It's the pieces of the book that aren't dialogue. I really, don't, I don't, I'm not sure what prose is, but um, so I probably shouldn't talk too much about it. Other than to say that you know everybody has their own style of prose. And like I have my own style, and I think it's a, probably a decent style to emulate. Not that I didn't emulate from somebody else, but I just get out of the way. I just don't put in a whole bunch of unnecessary words. I tell the story, and I take the. I take the uh, position that if it doesn't need to be in that paragraph, it shouldn't be in that paragraph. What's it doing in there? Get out. So that makes good writing because you're crisp and the information is there and the reader doesn't have to labor to figure out what's going on or just to, just to stay with you. Um, so if it doesn't belong there, get it out. Now, and then there's vocabulary. Um, I thought that I was intimidated about starting to be a writer because I thought that I didn't have a good enough vocabulary. And then I wasn't smart enough. And writing is about neither. And neither is reading. Reading's not about either. Understanding stuff is not about being smart or having a great vocabulary. And I'm, the, what broke it for me was I read an, uh, an interview from this one guy who writes detective novels. And he, was, he had the same exact thoughts. He was, I was really afraid of writing. I really wanted to write, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, my vocabulary is terrible. And, um, but then he said, I found, you know, I can't remember the rest of it, but the rest of the interview was he managed to write without having a good vocabulary, and it's because he had good ideas, and he, he followed all these other rules. So you don't have to have a good vocabulary. In fact, you can have too good a vocabulary. And like, in this book, I went through the book and took out all the big words. I'm like, that's too big a word, probably most people. I mean, I mean I'm writing it for people to read. And if I think that most people who buy a book with a sore on the cover probably <laughs> don't know this word in year. I think I used the word in year at one of the, and I just use it. And I'm like, I bet they don't know what that means. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a little fuzzy on it myself. Um, but whenever I did use a big word, I'd always put it in context so that you should be able to figure out what this word means. Otherwise, I didn't use it. So, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, hammer people and embarrass people. And I, so I took all the big words out of this book and I still had a friend come up to me and say, a lot of big words in that book. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell them, dude, I took all the big words out. <laughs> you know. So, anyway. Um, but you don't need a good vocabulary. You don't need to be some super genius. William Faulkner is a, is a tremendous example of a, uh, probably the, the perfect example of a writer that did not have a big vocabulary. You know, I don't think he ever wrote a, a word that was longer than seven letters. I really don't. Um, not that there aren't some obscure words that are less than seven <laughs> letters, but he, but, um, he made his writing sing in other, other ways. So I would never be intimidated by the whole vocabulary issue. 
and you know, and, and people get people will see it too. It's, it's another reason to jump out of the story. It's people throw in these really dramatic words, and I'm like, oh, for God's sake, okay, it's, okay, genius, you know, um, you're a genius. I get it. Can you just tell the story? <laughs> and finally, the, the, the most critical element for um, to be a good writer, and this is to be a good anything, quite frankly, is discipline. And you know, wisdom and judgment go with discipline, but you have to have discipline. And just because you wrote it, you know this from your background, just because you wrote it doesn't make it genius. Okay? Oh, I wrote it and I sweated. I'm not throwing this out. It doesn't really fit the story, but I wrote it. And I worked really hard and I stayed up really late that night. I'm going I'm to keep it in there. You have to have the discipline to, to throw that stuff out. And I learned this the hard way. It was actually the moment that I knew that I was going to be successful at writing. In, in writing. And, and I'm you know, moderately successful at best, but nonetheless, um, I had gone off on a tangent on this book. And, I, and for six weeks, eight hour days, six weeks of a lot of work, I just sort of went down this path. And, it, and then one day I just was like, oh, it's good. It's polished. I went through it and polished it. It wasn't rough but like this. I mean, it was really nice because I was into it. And I'm like, it's, but it's, it's good. It looks good. It, it fits a lot of things, but it's not right. It's not right. And so I highlighted six weeks worth of work in that Microsoft Word document. My finger hovered over the delete button. But I wanted to be a good writer. I wanted to do it. This is why lots of people that's why there's not a lot of good writers, because I was able to push the button. I know a lot of people can't push the button. It wasn't fun to push the button, but I swallowed hard and deleted it. And in that situation, was that, that part of the story was very close, and there wasn't anything really horribly wrong with it. It just wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't perfect. It was just a shade off. And by that, I mean, um, imagine, imagine painting your house. You're going to paint it white. So you go to the paint store, you look at chips, you pick the ivory chip that you like, and you've got a beautiful Victorian house in downtown Ann Arbor, and it's got, uh, you know, curly cues and a bunch of, uh, you know, it's a difficult house to paint. You get out the ladders, you get out the sanders, the chippers, you scrape, you work for six weeks, eight-hour days, and you paint your house white in an ivory shade. You paint it white. Then you stand back, and you look at the house, white, it's good, but you know in your heart that if ivory is the wrong shade, it should have been eggshell. <laughs> should have been eggshell. Now here's the, this is where, this is a, this is a big female crowd here, so, uh, but this is where you separate the men from the boys. And this is when I knew that I was not a boy, that I was a man, for as far as I remember. Pardon the whole gender thing. Um, but. The boys will say, it's white, good enough, done. But the men will say, no. Oh. And they'll go to the store, and they'll buy 15 gallons of <laughs> eggshell, and they'll get out the ladders and scrapers, and they'll do it again. And they'll do it right. So that takes a lot of discipline. It takes judgment to know that you're making the right decision. It takes a lot of discipline to do that, and it's hard to do, which is why all these publishers in New York get a bunch of junk on their desks, because these guys did not push the delete button, and they didn't change from ivory to eggshell. And so the book, and it shows, it doesn't, it's not good, or it's not good enough for a bunch of people to get excited about it and read it. There's some, there's some other things that are about writing, but you know, they write whole books about this stuff, and I'll give some books, some examples of some good books for you, but, um, you know, there's, there's, Heart and passion. You know, you need to your characters, and there needs to be heart and passion in the story for people to care about it. And there needs to be some conflict. But conflict is such a gigantic issue that I'm not even going to go into it here. But basically, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of conflict, and there needs to be conflict in the story. Something needs to be opposing. If the people are just walking down, you know, if your heroes are just walking down the street and everything, every time they do it's, it's a home run, and then it's pretty boring. You're gonna stop reading because like, it's a good home run every time. What's the point? So, um, so there's a lot of things, and I'm gonna come down to this later. You know, I'm, I'm gonna when I, when I finish this talk, which will be shortly, I'm gonna give you the secret to success in, in writing. Okay, and it's also the secret to success in a lot of things, but I'm gonna deliver the secret, and it goes with some of these things I just talked about. Um, 
All right, now this is, I'm going to digress a little bit. Can we do the camera zoom thing, Robert? Um, this was the book cover for my first book. Can you see this okay? Um, this is it right here. See how close to this? It is this, in fact. Um, well, that's how it came out. But, you know, the, the, I had a big giant uh, uh, publishing company, Time Warner. My editors, Les and Beth. They hired this uh, Steve Stone, who does all the, uh, he does a bunch of covers for big books. And he does, you know, fantasy books, and he does Stephen King books. And I'm like, oh, Steve, good enough for Stephen King. I, I think he's good enough for me. Uh, but the first, this is the only big conference call I had with the editor was about this cover. They said, Terry, we emailed you the cover. What do you think? And I delayed a day because I wasn't, you know, lots of stuff was good about the cover. But there were some issues. I had some issues with the cover. And... Can we, can we now see this okay, Robert? This was the first run at the cover. And the guy had some, you know, Steve had some difficulties. He had to not make it too cartoonish. It's not a Conan the Barbarian book. It's, a, it's an action adventure with a guy with a sword, but it's a little bit heavier than the, the, the run of the mill Conan stuff. Um, so I took one look at this picture and I said, you know, Steve Stone, he's, a, you know, he's the artist. He's from London. He's, he's, he's English. I don't think you ever saw Michael Dukakis with that uh, big helmet on his head. You guys are probably maybe, you know, remember Michael Dukakis had this big, this, the helmet's too big for this guy, okay, it's too big. Okay, that's the number one problem. And, I, and, and then I told the editors, I said, and you know, he doesn't look like he really wants to go out to fight today. <laughs> he looks like he'd rather be a member of a rock band or maybe, you know, it's not really, uh, I'm not, I'm actually not scared of that guy, actually. I might walk up and like, you know, hit him, see what, see what, he, see what he does to me, you know. And finally, um, I said, and these are my exact words, I said, I'm no Freud, but I shouldn't that sword be pointing up? <laughs> and so there was some, so the, the artist, to his credit, you know, and, 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 and Beth, my head editor at uh, Time Warner, she goes, yeah, that, that sword needs to be pointing up, man. that's not right. So she, so this is what he came up with. So this is part of the marketing process. And I bring this up because just a, on the side about marketing of books, you know, they were they didn't know, you know, where do we put the book? Well, I think it's supposed to go in the fiction section at, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble, right? I go to the fiction section, I'm looking for it, I'm supposed to be right there next to Cormac McCarthy, you know? But it's not there. You know, in some stores it was, but in many stores it was not, and probably wisely so, because they ended up selling a lot of books, but, you know, I, it, 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 there's a guy with a store, I mean, the, 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 the clerks in the back of Barnes and Noble would open the box and, there's 30 books there, and we're like, oh, God of the Sword, fantasy. And, and same thing, you know, in, all the way in San Jose, the store in San Jose. Oh, God of the Sword, put in the fantasy section. So my book was next to all these, it was in the Dungeons and Dragons fantasy sci-fi section. And my, and my book's right next to some other book with a, a chick in a bikini with a laser <laughs> headband, and she also has a dagger that, with the glowing rubies, and, and, and next to her is a, is a dragon. He's got a battle axe and, and some pants. You know, these, this was the section, you know, but Steve Stone, the, the artist, he promised me, Terry, I, I'll, I'll sell books, don't, don't you, no, not to worry, Terrence, I'll sell some books, he said, so, and he was right, so, um, and, and, and there wasn't a single complaint, nobody went home, read the book, and came back and said, hey, what, there's no dragons, or there's no potions, or magic, there's no magic in here, I want my money back, not a single person asked for their money back, so, um, made it through. So, How many books did you sold? You know, I don't know. Um, my publisher knows. The first run, they, they, they did, um, they did like a couple of runs, in the, and I don't remember. I think the first run was 25,000, and they're waiting to do now another run, which is why we can't find the book, for me to finish my next book. So. As soon as the next book comes out, we'll do more. But I didn't sell it. didn't sell a gazillion. I mean, I'm not a household name. And they, and they had to make, they had to make a big deal out of the artwork and hire a good artist because no one's going to buy it because of Terry McCarthy. Because I, nobody knows who I am. So you know, if if I became some big shooter, it'd be Terry McCarthy in big letters and the little guy with a sword down here. <laughs> so that's that's marketing for you. But um, and it's a paperback, so it's not that difficult to. I don't think it's that difficult to sell a bunch of them because it's not like twenty-two dollars. It's like eight, seven dollars, eight dollars. Um, but but it's the kind of book I want because it's the kind of book I grew up with. This which is why I wrote this book. I grew up with adventure stories. I loved them. And I always had a paperback. I 
back pocket. <laughs> and so it came out as a paperback. I had some, I had some snotty friends go, oh, it's not a hardback. Uh, you, know. So, you know what? I like the paperback just fine. And it's my kind of writing. Um, and I'm, I'm almost done here, guys. Um, when you when you go to publish a book, when you try to, when you're communicating with the publishing powers that be, when you communicate with agents, you need to do the nitty gritty stuff, which is it needs to be in the proper format. And this is largely in the proper format, these uh, sample chapters. But you know, double space courier or something that looks like courier so much that I can't tell that it's not courier. Twelve point. And it needs to have your name on the top on the left and the title of the book on the top on the on the right. It needs to be paginated and don't put the page one on the on the uh, uh, don't, no page one. Start page two. They have these really strict format rules. And you can find them on the internet. Any agency agent site, any publisher site has what's the proper format for a novel. Um, but that's important to do that because if it's if it's not in the right format, they're going to go amateur and they can't throw it fast enough. And I can't tell you how fast they will drop that thing. If it doesn't look right, they'll go. I can't even drop it fast enough. It'll be, it'll, it'll be gone because they get so much junk. Um, and there are some good books on writing that I would recommend. One is by uh, one's called The Art of Creative Writing by a guy named uh, Lajos Agri. His last name is E G R I. Um, he's very eccentric, but he's a terrific, uh, terrific teacher. Another one is uh, called Dare to Be a Great Writer by Leonard Bishop. That's my favorite book because it comes in bite-sized pieces. Like you can open up to one page. It's just a one-page lesson. Uh, Interconflict and opposing characters. And it's just, you know, I'm done. I, I read, you don't have to read the whole book. You can read chunks of it for what you think you need help on. And then Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing that was mostly about his story. But there were, enough, there were some really good writing tips in there. It was an easy book to read. Now, when it comes to getting published with the publishers and agents, good luck is all i got to say because it's not easy. You've got to be good and lucky. And that book's got to be finished. If the book is not perfect, if it's not finished, they might change a couple things. Might, my editor said, you know, the only conversation I had about changing it was, they said, can you make the ending a little better because it's kind of flat. And I'm like, yeah, the ending's flat. You have any suggestions? No, you, you figured it out. I'm like, OK. <laughs> I did. I made the ending not flat. I made the ending better. So, um, but it needs to be done. And if it's not finished, even a sixth grader will notice. I mean, they will. They will notice. And so they, they use the publishers use agents to filter out all the crap, so they don't because they get so much crap they just throw it out. But they figure if an agent has at least read it, someone who's in the industry knows what they're doing, they're going to they're take some of their own sweet, their own precious time. They come in with a book. They're listening. Because someone they respect has already vetted the book. How do you get an agent? How did you get an agent? I got an agent the old fashioned, you know, but the Kevin Bacon way, the six degrees of separation. But I had a couple, I had, um, I, I, I couldn't get a, a, a good agent. And I, I couldn't actually get a, a, a good agent. So I, I started calling people I knew on the East Coast, said, Do you know a literary agent? No. Do you know one? No, 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 no. Finally, I go, Yeah, I had dinner with one like two years ago. What's his name? <laughs> and that's when I called the guy up and he said, I'll read it. And, he read it and he called me the next day and said, I'm your man. So, um, so that's how I got an agent. And that's how I would recommend anybody to get an agent. Start, everybody knows somebody, their mom knows somebody, their, mom, their, their favorite aunt knows somebody, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who's a freaking literary agent. <laughs> and because there's a gazillion literary agents, but you don't know what they're doing. Like my agent right now, he's booked. He goes, Terry, I got, I got enough clients, I can't take another client, I don't care who they are. And some other agent, you can send your stuff to an agent, and he may be looking for business, but he's a sports guy. He just writes sports books. So, you know, it's a real shot in the dark, so it's really helpful to start calling people around. The, the next best thing is to find the publisher who writes your kind of stuff, or who publishes your kind of book, and send them the manuscript with a cover letter that says, Hi, I have this kind of writing experience. This is my book. Thanks for looking at it. And hope for the best. But if it's done, if it's finished, They'll, you, you should get, and it's good, you should get some response. And here's, the, and here's why. The publishers get all this junk every day, and it's mostly junk. And so, you know, let's say that they've got author A, who shows genius, oh, there's some genius in here, but boy, it needs a lot of work. Well, they don't want to do a bunch of work. Why would they, you know, that's just like you and me. Why would I want to do a bunch of work? You know, then they've got author B, 
Not as genius, but it's done. We're going to do Jack. This thing's ready to publish. Send it out to the printer. Maybe, you know, change a name or something. It's good. it's good to go. And that's what I was. I was author B. The, the book was done. They looked at it, and they kept reading it, and they kept reading it, and they kept reading it, and they're like, it's, it's done. You know, we don't need to do anything. Um, so, so that's important. You want to be author B. You want that book to be done, and then you'll get some attention. If they need to do a bunch of work to make it better, no matter what a genius, and that, no matter what genius you are, they're not gonna. They're, they're, it's unlikely they're gonna go with it. They don't have this old-fashioned mentoring relationship where they're gonna work with you forever and ever until you're a great author and you publish four of books until you publish a good one. It's not gonna happen. So, um, um, right. The one secret. To, I'm, I'm, I'm done almost. The one secret to success that I promised that I would give you. The one secret to success. The one secret to success, and this is anticlimactic, so don't ever do this, don't do this in a book. Okay? But the one secret to success is that there is no one secret to success. Okay? Your characters could be great, but the rest of it's not good. Forget it. Your plot could be fantastic, that is exciting. If, it's, if the characters aren't believable, forget it. If your pace is off, if your vocabulary is goofy, if the punctuation is in the wrong place, if you can't follow some of these basic dialogue tricks, it's over. So, um, the trick to writing a book is um, you need to do about a dozen things right on page one, on page 11, on page 71, and page 371. You can never not do all dozen things right from the beginning to the end. If you make one slip up, someone's going to notice and you will have failed. So, Oh, uh, that's the secret. You got to do a, a gazillion things right, and otherwise you don't have a chance. So <laughs> that was a happy note. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the truth is, you can do a gazillion things right once you know what you're doing. Once you, if you pay attention to all these things, and you're smart, and you're disciplined, and you want to do a good job, you'll know. You know what? I got to fix this. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for having me at, at, at GoogleAuthors.com or wherever you are exactly. <laughs> Sunny Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thanks you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for